It's a really interesting and exciting time to be involved with machine learning um, because machine learning is in many ways the perfect tool for analyzing today's world. The thing that really fuels machine learning is data. And today we have this explosion in the volume of data that we have at our disposal, um, which means that it can sometimes be really difficult to unravel and understand these um, these cause and effect phenomena that, that drive our world. So in many ways, machine learning tools really provide the key to um, unlocking and making sense of that data. And there's really no other tool set that is likely to be able to deliver such insights um, in an efficient way going into the future. Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. Welcome to the Better System Trader podcast. Andrew Swanscott here, and this is episode number 82. Glad you could join us. Machine learning has seen a huge amount of growth over recent years with uh, the increase in available data and processing power. It's an incredibly powerful tool set for uncovering patterns and relationships in data. However, these tools can be challenging to learn, apply correctly, and are also open to abuse. Our guest for this episode Chris Longmore from Robot Wealth specializes in machine learning, algo trading, and artificial intelligence. He's the co-founder and head of quantitative research at Quantify Partners, and he also provides consulting and educational services through his website, Robot Wealth. In this episode, Chris is going to share with us some of his insights into machine learning and strategy validation, including how machine learning can be used to analyze huge amounts of data uncover patterns and relationships, and define a trading edge. Also, how machine learning tools can be abused and the common mistakes that traders make with machine learning. Strategy validation techniques that best suit market data and one popular technique that shouldn't be used. How to approach the vast libraries of algorithms available today. Why delaying the trading process can lead to opportunity cost. How to know when a model is ready for trading and much more. So let's head straight into this chat with Chris. Hi, Chris. Welcome to the show. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Andrew. It's great to be here. Well, it's really great to have you here as well because uh, I was looking at the list of the best articles of all time on Quantocracy the other day and you hold not only the top spot but the second spot as well, which is a great achievement. So well done. Thank you very much. Now, it's great to see an Aussie at the top of the leaderboard there. And I think (laughs) (laughs) it's a testament to the quality of information you share. So I'm really excited to be talking with you today. And we've got some really great stuff to cover. Um, But before we do get started, how about you share some of your background story with us so that we kind of understand where you're coming from and and how you got into trading? Sure. Okay. So um, my formal education is mechanical and environmental engineering. Um, And I, I spent 10 years working in that field as an engineer and a scientist um, before I got into trading, um, doing things like computer simulations of environmental processes, um, building environmental monitoring systems in remote parts of Australia. Um, I I had a really, really fun time as an engineer for for a long time. Um, And I got into trading many years ago now, um, basically through a friend um, who who, who sort of introduced me to the market um, and, and really got me hooked. Um, so I basically started, you know, developing my own systems, um, and you know, learning learning the hard way um, about trading. Um, fast forward, fast forward a few years, um, and I basically do this stuff full time now. Um, so uh, you know, I'm now an algorithmic trader um, using you know quantitative tools, particularly machine learning um, for finance. Um, I, I've been a proprietary trader in the past, um, and I've also held a fairly senior quant position at a hedge fund. Um, but these days, my work mostly consists of consulting on machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, quantitative research, that sort of things, that, those sort of things. Um, and I'm also involved with an early stage AI startup, which I, I can't talk too much about at the moment, but um, I certainly plan on, on talking about that a hell of a lot more on my blog um, in the future because it's, it's really exciting. 
Yeah, cool. So, um, as you mentioned, you uh, you specialize in machine learning now. Uh, were you using any of the uh, the techniques that you're now using in trading? Were you using any of those when you were doing your modeling work as an engineer? Um, a little bit. Um, not as much as I would have liked. So, when, when I was doing, you know, simulations of environmental processes, um, there wasn't a lot of machine learning and that sort of stuff. But mm. towards the end of my engineering career, I was lucky enough to be involved with um, some fairly interesting projects that that required some machine learning, um, and one one of those was um, building a building an algorithm that could identify um, endangered species habitat from satellite imagery. Um, and so, yeah, that that was a, a really interesting project. So I guess um, yeah, I got to use some of that some of those machine learning skills in in that particular project. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, I guess it's a great opportunity to discuss machine learning now, since you <laughs> since you specialise in it. So, p- perhaps we'll just start with a a few elementary questions first, and then we can dig a little bit deeper into the topic. So, uh, I guess the most basic question to start with is, um, what exactly is machine learning? Okay. Um, well, at a, at its most basic, um, machine learning is simply, um, you know, it simply refers to the use of a learning algorithm, obviously to uncover um, insights from, from data that may or may not be obvious. Um, and so, so look, based on that description, you could consider something like um, the fitting of a least squares regression line to be a low-level form of machine learning. So in that process, we use an algorithm to find um, the line that minimizes the sum of the squared errors um, between the, 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 the actual data and the values predicted by that line. Um, Machine learning is really just taking that sort of um, framework to another level. So um, more complex machine learning approaches like neural networks, support vector machines, and so on um, can uncover more complex nonlinear relationships um, between many variables. So so that's machine learning in a nutshell. It's it's essentially um, building statistical models of representations of your data. Yeah, okay. So what are the the key benefits of using this? Because um, I think maybe you touched on it a little bit when you said um, patterns that are not obvious. I think that's probably part of the key there. But what are the main benefits in using machine learning techniques over perhaps doing them uh, using human, what's the word, human learning? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Probably not a term, is it? Human-driven analysis, I guess. Yeah, that's right, yeah. It's it's, it's a really interesting and exciting time to be involved with machine learning. Um, And and I'll, and I'll explain exactly why that is. Um, it's because machine learning is in many ways the perfect tool for analyzing today's world. Um, and by that, I mean that the thing that really fuels machine learning is data. Um, and today we have this explosion in the volume of data that we have at our disposal. So things like you know the digital tracks that we leave as individuals right through to corporations whose sole purpose of existence is to provide you know, new and interesting data for us to analyze. Mm. Um, but really, there's never been um, such a vast um, and dense information e- environment that exists today. Um, and so at the same time that we're having this explosion in data, the world is also becoming, you know, more and more interconnected, um, certainly feels more complex than it's ever been before, which means that it can sometimes be really difficult to unravel and understand these um, these cause and effect phenomena that, that drive our world. Um, so in many ways, machine learning tools really provide the key to um, unlocking and making sense of that data um, and then by extension making sense of the world as well. Um, and I guess one of the what, where I'm, what I'm driving at with this is that there's really no other tool set that is likely to be able to deliver such insights um, in an efficient way going into the future. Um, you know, we, we hear all the time about this, this so-called big data revolution um, well, you know, data is something that can and should drive the way we interact with the world. So we, we have this, this enormous opportunity that we've never really had in history before to make better decisions driven by this information. Um, but the reality is there's simply too much of it to make sense without some fairly sophisticated tools. Uh, if, we, if we could only use that data efficiently, there's huge potential there to enrich many aspects of our lives. Um, and when it comes down to it, machine learning and artificial intelligence is is literally the key to unlocking that potential. So, you know, to, to bring that back to trading, um, <clears throat> pardon me, um, I think in the recent past, um, machine learning could be used to find an edge in the markets. But pretty soon, and, and maybe even already, um, I believe that machine learning will be required simply to maintain 
um, and that you might have previously had. So it's it's going to be incredibly important um, for, for both trading and non-trading applications, I, I believe. Yeah, and I think another factor that's kind of helping to drive machine learning and AI, especially over the last couple of years, is we've had a, a huge um, boost in processing power. You know, machines are getting faster and faster, and, and it's going to continue for a while, I'm sure. So it's really, um, you know, the combination of all these factors have really provided us with some really powerful tools which could yeah. be open to abuse, which I think we're going to get to a little bit uh, later in our chat. But yes, um, so let's let's just talk a little bit more about the applications of machine learning in a kind of a, like a high level view. How what are the ways you can use machine learning in um, in a trading sense? Okay, well, um, in a trading sense, I guess the goal of using machine learning is um, at its most fundamental is to uncover some sort of insight that you can use to make better than random predictions about the market from which you can profit. So um, so there's a, there's a number of different ways you can do that. Um, one way that you might think about is through uh, something called data mining. That is, um, we use machine learning to f- essentially find patterns in a data set that we hope will repeat. Um, now, the reality of this one is that it, it sounds really appealing, but it's actually not particularly useful in a, in a trading sense, um, at least in my experience. Um, and essentially the reason for that is because there's this huge potential to uncover spurious insights um, using that approach. So that's things that might simply be um, like an artifact of the sample you're looking at um, and which don't generalize at all. And I'll, I guess we'll come back to that um, a little bit later in the chat. Um, but that, that sort of phenomenon arises both because machine learning algorithms are, are generally quite powerful, um, but it also arises because of the nature of, of financial data itself. Um, so, you know, to account for those things properly, it can be technically quite difficult um, and computationally expensive. Um, so I tend to, to shy away from that blind data mining approach a little bit. Um, a much better approach that I've found is to use what I call intelligent data mining. And that, that involves either engineering or, or identifying variables or features that are at least more likely to have some sort of relationship with whatever it is you're trying to predict. And that's where your domain knowledge of the markets is really important um, and likewise your own creativity is as well. Um, so so that, that really gives you uh, like a starting point, some, some, some place from which you can, you can form a hypothesis. Um, but again, that approach is not you know, without its drawbacks as well. It's, it's still um, prone to some of its own biases. Um, another approach you might use in trading is to, again, you know, leverage your knowledge of the markets to propose a model for a particular characteristic or some some phenomenon that you've observed. You can then use um, machine learning to to fit your model, that is, um, find the optimal parameters for that model, um, and then also use machine learning to diagnose how well it fits um, out of sample. So in that in that case, you already have um, some knowledge or at least you have an idea about some sort of relationship um, between your data and the thing you're trying, trying to predict. Um, and you use machine learning to essentially parameterize that relationship. Um, so one of the big advantages of, of using machine learning for a task like that um, is that you can start to think about quite complex nonlinear relationships amongst many variables. Um, and that, that's typically been hard to do in the past with our, you know, the tools we've had at our, at our disposal. Um, I, I probably don't need to say this, but I should also point out that by you know optimal and best fit, um, I'm certainly not talking about curve fitting. I'm talking about you know, generalization out of sample. Um, if, I, if I can, I'll mention one other approach um, just because it's, it's really interesting and your listeners may, may have heard about this one as well, um, and that's leveraging machine learning to extract insights from data that um, might act as uh, a proxy for future, future price movements. Um, and probably the best-known example of that is uh, the use of satellite images to track things like um, ship movements, changes to farmland and crops over time, um, and then inferring future price movements you know, of, of, the, of the related markets. Um, in that case, machine learning is, is not necessarily being used to make the predictions, but it's actually being used to process um, these vast amounts of data quite quickly, that, that is the satellite images, um, in order to confer um, you know, what we'd call an information advantage on, on the trader. Um, and if you think about it, that approach is is actually quite old. So, um, you know, back in the day, Rothschild did something quite similar with a network of carrier pigeons, where he basically 
was able to receive information before anyone else and, and act on it. Um, so that's another way we could use machine learning. We could um, uncover these you know, interesting, difficult insights um, a lot faster than anyone else can get them if, if, we, if we can identify what they are. Yeah, I think that's a really uh, interesting area of research. It's um, it's kind of exploding because I'm sure we've all seen the, you know, the articles on the internet about um, satellite images of car parks in Walmart and you know looking at the lid on oil tanks to see you know how much oil they have and you know even it's- even processing social media sentiment and you know all this external data that which which has really become readily available to us now and and I think there's probably more insights that we will get by thinking about how we can use that information and how it feeds back into uh, ultimately market prices I guess so yeah I think it's, that's a I couldn't agree with you more there Andrew and I think um often it, it's very easy uh, you know as a trader to get bogged down in um you know just trying to predict um you know tomorrow's market movement or whatever it is you're interested in Whereas some of these tools, you know, if we think outside the box a little bit, um, we, you know, we can leverage the power that they have to process vast amounts of information relatively quickly to, to gain such an information advantage. And and the way you do that is really only limited by your your creativity. And and as I said previously, with this explosion of data sources um, at our fingertips, um, it's a really exciting time to be involved in this space. Absolutely. Now, did you want to mention something about segregation as well? Um, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about that. So um, segregation is um, essentially an approach that belongs to the realm of unsupervised learning. So um, unsupervised learning is about extracting insights from data without um, a particular outcome in mind, so without a, without trying to predict anything. So um, what, what that means is that we use it to uncover, um, for example, um, like any natural structure or clustering that might exist within a data set. Um, and a simple example of that might be um, to cluster a market um, into different regimes. So obviously we don't know about bull and bear regimes, but um, perhaps there's others that aren't quite as obvious to a human observer that you know exist under the surface. Um, unsupervised learning can be used to um, extract those sort of insights and bring them bring them to the surface. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Chris. So I think um, you've kind of covered some of the benefits of machine learning by talking about the applications there, but um, perhaps it's also time to look at some of the dangers because, mm. as we've already mentioned, these tools are very powerful and you know, can be easy to abuse. Now, I know that you do work with other traders and you've got some courses and things like that, so you probably um, see a lot of traders making the same kind of mistakes. So through your own experiences and also through observing others, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges that traders can face using machine learning? Yeah, that, that's a that's a really good question because um, really what machine learning does is or has the potential to um, essentially amplify um, all of those problems, all of those things that can go wrong um, <clears throat> with, with with other methods of trading. So um, the big one that I'm thinking of obviously is, is overfitting to the data. Um, so machine learning is, is very powerful and it's becoming more and more powerful as time goes on. Um, and financial data is by its very nature quite noisy um, and non-stationary. So you throw those three things in the mix together and you have this perfect, perfect storm for, for overfitting. Um, and that's I quite often see that that's the, the biggest hurdle for people to, to get over. Um, but I actually don't believe that overfitting is the is the biggest challenge. There's there's plenty of tools out there um, and you know uh, applied machine learning techniques that can that can counter um, overfitting. Um, and I'll talk about some other problems in a, in a moment. But um, in terms of, of, of getting across the problem of overfitting. Um, we can do things like cross validation, which is which is obviously very important, um, but it's a little bit different in the financial market. So, in, in a classic data science problem, we might use something called um, k-fold cross validation, which is uh, essentially you know you, you use it for non-stationary. Uh, sorry, you use it for stationary non-autocorrelated data. Um, Whereas, you know, obviously our financial data is quite a bit different to that. There are very strong, or, you know, there are usually autocorrelations present. Um, stationarity is a big issue. Um, so for our data, we'd use something that we call time series cross-validation instead. And um, your listeners would know this is by another name, um, walk-forward analysis. Yeah. Exactly the same thing. Yeah. Um, so, but one, you know, that, that's a great way to sort of validate your model out of sample. Um, but quite often what I see is people doing one walk-forward analysis 
and then making like a binary decision, yes or no, trade this model or don't trade this model. Um, there's, a, there's a few other things you can and should do on top of a, a single walk forward and, um, and one of those, which is you know, relatively simple to do, um, is to ensure that your model is, is stable across a range of window lengths when you do your walk forward. So, so mm-hmm. vary, vary the window lengths and record the performance. Um, and look at the stability of that performance across that across those window lengths. Um, if if you don't do that, if you just use one time series cross validation and make a binary decision, you'll almost certainly fall into the trap of believing that something works, you know, due to luck alone. Um, so, yeah. so that's that's one sort of robustness tool that can help you get around get around that. Yeah, if I can just add a little bit to that, actually, we had uh, Bob Pardo on the show oh, yes. um, yeah, a couple of months ago, and, and one of the points that he made about Walk Forward was um, he said, you know, you can actually have a, a great result purely by chance. So, Absolutely. you know, he actually uh, he, he does a similar kind of technique that you mentioned, looking over different lengths and uh, making decisions based on that. So Absolutely. I think that's a, that's a really important thing to remember. It really is. Um, yeah, Bob's right on the money there. Um, if, you know, especially when you use machine learning, you can start you know, doing thousands or even tens of thousands of these you know, sorts of analyses. Um, and if you think about it, you're almost certainly going to find something that, that worked really well just by chance, just because, you've, just because of the sheer volume of things that, you, that you've looked at. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But look, I mean, that's, that's kind of you know, overfitting at the strategy level. But um, I mean, maybe people are interested in um, tools to help with overfitting at the algorithm level, and that's things like, um, you know, regularization, which is it's just simply a mathematical trick that shrinks some of the coefficients of your model. Um, personally, I do a lot of stuff with um, with neural networks these days, mm. um, in particular deep and recurrent architectures, um, multiple machines, autoencoders. Um, and what I've found is that using a technique called dropout is probably the single most useful technique in controlling the overfitting of such models. Um, and, and dropout is is quite simple. It's, it's just basically um, the random dropping out of particular units um, or inputs um, or, or neurons um, from, from your network throughout the training phase. Um, it sounds really simple, but it's an incredibly powerful technique to control overfitting for, for a neural network. Okay, so that didn't sound simple to me because I don't know much about <laughs> neural networks. But what I think I'm, I'm hearing you say is that if you've got a number of uh, inputs or, or parameters, you just drop one out and see what the effect is, and you're essentially you're testing the impact of each one individually on on the combined strategies. Yeah, that, that's that right? that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. You can, you can also drop out as well as the inputs. You can drop out um, hidden neurons as well. So when you you know, when you've got a deep architecture, you might have a number of different layers to your to your network, um, and you can drop out you know a proportion of, of the neurons in your hidden layers as well, um, and that basically just forces the network um, to learn, uh, or for each path through the network to learn its own um, relationships between the data and the output. So it kind of um, you know tries to get around um, you know some of the overfitting and, and what have you that can go on. So. Um, and it's it's actually been shown to be um, equivalent, if not better, than um, some other um, you know, overfitting techniques, such as regularization, um, which is used quite common. Used quite commonly. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, if I can just jump back to Kfold for a minute, um, because yeah, sure. I think it's some people are probably familiar with it, and maybe others aren't. So, can you give us a kind of a quick explanation on, on what it is? Sure. So, um, so again, Kfold cross validation is something that we should in general, steer away from in, in financial data. But right. um, what Kfold is used for in, well, it's, what, what it is is um, a validation technique for um, essentially for stationary data sets like you find in most classic machine learning problems. Um, so what Kfold does is it takes your uh, your training set and it splits it up into a number of different partitions, um, so K partitions. Um, and what it does is it, you then train your model on all but one of those partitions and then test it on the petition that you didn't use in the training. Um, then you you simply change that petition that was left out, redo the training um, with a with a different petition left out, um, and then validate it on that new petition. Um, and you repeat that obviously k times, and then you simply aggregate the results um, from each of the validation steps. Right. Okay. So the main reason uh, to not use that kind of approach is because of the non-stationarity of the the time series. Is that right? Um, it's it's yeah it's more more to do with um, with the autocorrelations that oh. exist in financial data. So if you can imagine um, you know if 
if you're mixing up, if you're randomizing the order of, of your data in order to do your training, um, that you're basically losing those autocorrelations. Mm. And so that that kind of if it kind of doesn't really make sense to do that in, in financial data. So much, much better ways to use um, your time series cross validation, which basically does the same thing, except that all of your petitions are um, adjacent to each other. So your, your training petition is directly adjacent to your validation petition. Mm, okay. Um, so we mentioned briefly about um, what Bob Pardo said about you know, looking at vast numbers of different models and basically landing on something that works due to chance. Mm-hmm. Um, well, obviously, you know, with, as I said, with machine learning, we can test thousands or tens of thousands or more um, different variations of our system relatively quickly. And the, the reason that's dangerous is because um, given like a finite historical data set or a finite sample of data, um, you'll almost certainly stumble across something that, that, that worked. Um, so even if you're, even if you know you're saying, um, um, you know, I'll, I'll reject everything except the top one percent of the systems that I look at. Well, you know, you only have to look at a hundred before you find, you know, something that sits in that top one percent. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it is a it is a significant problem, and I actually believe that this problem, which I refer to as data mining bias, is um, much more insidious and difficult than, than overfitting. Um, and so, so getting across that, it requires, um, you know, some sort of method to account for that bias. And there's, there's been a couple that have been proposed, um, but they can be quite tricky to implement. Um, but I'll mention them anyway. So White's Reality Check is one method that was published by um, a guy named Halbert White back in, in uh, the early 2000s. Yep. Um, but it has its own limitations as well. It's actually – it's prone to producing um, uh, false negatives. So it actually tends to reject a good system, um, which is a fair problem. Um, there's been some improvements proposed to White's process over the years, um, and there's some good papers um, by um, Romano and Wolf, uh, Hansen and Karate, which sort of came out um, between about 2005 and about 2012. Um, and you can find those by Googling. So they, they, they are quite nice additions to White's reality check. Um, another really useful tool to have in the toolkit is something called uh, system parameter permutation, which was proposed by a guy named Dave Walton back in 2014, and he actually won some awards for that paper. Um, and it's it's really useful as well. I actually use that quite a lot in my own trading. Um, and again, the, the paper's free. You can find it by Googling it. Um, it's a little bit tricky to implement for machine learning-based systems, but um, it's certainly worth um, adding to your toolkit. It's, it's a really, really useful um, robustness check, I guess. Okay, so we've spoken about uh, overfitting or curve fitting as one of the the challenges or dangers of machine learning. Is there anything else that you think is is really uh, impacts a lot of traders? Um, yeah, I guess it's kind of the um, the I guess one of the barriers to entry is that there can be a bit of a learning curve, you know, to getting up to speed with machine learning. Yep. So you know, I guess that begs the question: Well, how do you how do you get started with it? Um, and I guess the the good news, in a lot of ways, is that um, today machine learning is is more and more of a problem of um, practical application rather than a problem of, say, you know, computer science or software development. And what I mean by that is that um, we no longer really need to develop machine learning algorithms ourselves. So there's there's pre-written libraries that do pretty much anything right up to the cutting edge of AI research that are you know available open source online. Um, and that, that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a it's a it's a good thing in that it, it really enables um, efficient research to a wide range of people, um, but it can also get you into a little bit of trouble as well. Um, I, I really believe that it pays to have um, at least a cursory understanding of any sort of algorithm that you use um, from a computer science perspective before you before you go ahead and use someone else's implementation of it. Um, and the reason I say that is because. You know, diagnosing the performance of that algorithm is, is so much easier than if you went in blind. Um, and if you've, you know, if you're armed with that understanding, um, you can much more efficiently identify what's going wrong with your particular implementation and, and how to fix it. Um, <clears throat> so, what what I'm trying to say is, um, certainly, you know, the barriers to entry are, are being lowered all the time, and that's a that's in general a good thing. But certainly, it does pay to um, have at least some understanding of, of how how the algorithm works um, and just on that so like you know th- these two I've got a couple of courses that I that I really rave about 
Um, and they've both been around for a few years now, but I still think they're really relevant. Um, and they're both available on Coursera, um, and that's the Stanford Machine Learning course and the University of Toronto Neural Networks course. Um, they both have, you know, reasonably strong computer science components, but um, they also go into a lot of detail about the application and diagnostics of your of your algorithms. Um, and, you know, they're, they're taught by guys like Jeffrey Hinton, who's now VP of engineering at Google, um, Andrew Ng, who's chief scientist at Baidu. Um, you know, they, these guys are really at the top of their field um, and they, they're sharing their knowledge via these courses. Um, I, think, I think they're both a great place to start. Um, but having said that, you know, they are a few years old, um, so it does pay to try to stay up to, to speed with the latest developments as well as it's a really rapidly changing changing field yeah so uh, there are a large number of algorithms available and um you know lots of libraries as you mentioned so uh, do you re- recommend people starting uh, looking at a particular one or a particular field um just to get started and then branching out from there or how should they actually approach what they look into further um look i, I really i really think it's worth um starting out simple with machine learning so um you know start start out just looking at really simple you know, linear regression um, applied to, to, to different problems. Um, then, you know, go into something like, um, you know, decision tree, which is um, a fairly low level model as well. Um, easy to train, easy to diagnose. Um, and then, you know, you can start thinking about um, support vector machines and and in particular the field that I, or the type of algorithm that I and I use, you know, for, for pretty much everything is, um, is, is neural networks and deep neural networks that, um, the advances that have been made in that field in the last few years have just, just been quite mind-boggling. Um, and there's some really nice deep learning libraries that um, are now available um, through things like Keras, Theano, um, and, of course, TensorFlow, which Google um, open-sourced recently. Um, I've, I've just come back from the Google Cloud conference in San Francisco last week, and um, what I saw... Um, you know, the next generation of Google Cloud um, in terms of computational power, um, you know, access to out-of-the-box machine learning libraries. Um, it's, it's incredibly exciting. So to me, it, to me, it makes a lot of sense to um, get up to speed with something like TensorFlow as quickly as you can um, so you can also leverage um, Google's architecture to, for training models um, quite efficiently. Okay. All right, thanks, Chris. Now I just want to ask you one final question before we start wrapping up for today. Um, in one of the blog posts on your website, you made a statement, actually it might have been in a couple, I might have seen it a few times on your website actually, uh, you made a statement about how easy it is to get bogged down searching for or building the um, optimal model in quotes. Yep. <laughs> uh, I think this is something that can really catch a lot of people up if they're not careful. So how do you actually know when your models are ready for live trading? Yeah, th- this is something that I'm, I'm really big on actually because I've been sort of burnt by this um, as well in the past. It's a, I guess it's a lesson learned through um, through hard experience um, and certainly some opportunity cost as well. Um, but yeah, look, it is really easy to get bogged down in research, particularly if you um, you know if you've got you know an inquisitive mind or whatever. You you tend to um, you know you really enjoy your research. You, you could potentially you know research a particular idea forever. Um, and obviously, that's not ideal because if you if you do nothing but research, you never trade and you never make any money. Mm. Um, so the way that I get around this and and, um, and the way that I sort of advise people to get around it is um, to begin uh, your research got research process with your ending in mind. Um, and by that, I mean that um, I advise people to understand what your trading model should look like in terms of um, its performance, however you want to measure that. Um, as well as its correlation to your existing portfolio of strategies, um, and and to to have an idea about that before you even begin the research process. So, um, you know, have have your performance goals written down, um, and if you're using something like whites or, or system um, system parameter permutation, um, have some defined confidence intervals for those performance metrics before you even even get started. Um, and what that means is that um, you can then make data driven decisions throughout your research process about when or if to go live with the strategy um, and and really you know trying to make those decisions on the fly is um, is a real is a bit of a recipe for disaster so yeah so in a nutshell um, try to begin with clearly defined goals in mind um, both in terms of performance and confidence intervals if you if you're using the appropriate tools um, and 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 don't um, and, and if you do that you'll kind of save yourself from um, searching for this 
perfect system that, that doesn't really exist or I guarantee it doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned there that that you had um a little, there was a little bit of opportunity cost by um delaying the the trading process. So, can you tell us a little bit more about that? What do you mean by that? Sure. So, if um you know, trading trading research is about, you know, identifying um an opportunity in the market to to make money. Um and typically for the vast majority of anomalies or edges that you find in the market, um they they have a they have a lifespan. They're not they don't exist forever. Um, at least in my experience. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to identify an anomaly and then bring your trading strategy to market as, as quickly and as efficiently as you can. Mm. Um, and by not doing that, you potentially miss out on um, the period in time when your algorithm might have worked and might have made money. So, yeah, it's something I've, I've been I've been guilty of in the past and, um, yeah, kind of a tough lesson to learn but a, but a good one to learn as well. Yep, absolutely. All right, well, thanks a lot, Chris. Now I might just start wrapping up now with a few quick closing questions. Okay. Uh, the biggest lesson you've learnt through trading? Biggest lesson I've learnt through trading? That's that's easy. The biggest lesson is don't believe anything that you read about trading until you test it for yourself and um, always rely on um, the evidence that you've gathered yourself rather than, than what other people put in front of you. Not, not to say that there aren't great practitioners out there and people putting good information out there there certainly are um but it definitely pays to 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 test it for yourself yeah i think that's a big part of having belief in your strategies as well as if if you've actually done the work yourself rather than just copied some something someone said so yeah um okay next question what is the best trading advice you've ever received um okay so pro- probably the thing that helped me the most was um <clears throat> someone told me that um, if I was going to use a particular algorithm or um, a software tool for, for anything, whether it's, it's backtesting, simulation, um, machine learning, whatever, you know, a library or someone, someone else's software, um, try to code something comparable yourself from scratch first. It doesn't have to have all the bells and whistles, but um, try to code something that, that does a similar task yourself. Um, and really what that does, it gives you an incredible amount of um, understanding and insight um, into, the, into the particular tool that you're using. Um, which will come in so handy down the track when, you, when you're doing your research. Um, just from that advice alone, I, I think I learned, I've learned so much to, just from that. I think it's, it's really useful advice. Yeah, that's interesting. I've never actually heard that before. So <laughs> yeah, that, sounds- that was one thing that I think really, um, it, it really propelled my understanding of, of not only um, the markets, but also um, you know, of the tools that you can use to navigate the markets um, more, more than anything else. Mm, okay. Uh, what do you think is the most important ingredient to becoming a successful trader? Most important ingredient. Um, that, that's a, this is a bit more of a tricky one. Um, I'm really tempted to say hard work, perseverance, the ability to deal with rejection and failure, um, an evidence-based mindset. Um, yeah. that, that's all true. All of those things are really, really important and certainly prerequisites. Um, but I'm going to say something a bit more boring here. Um, in my experience, the single most important thing is um, is good, reliable execution, um, because without that, you're going to fail before you even get started. Um, and it's for, for someone like me, and I think for other quantitative researchers as well, it's something that is really easy to lose sight of when you're buried in you know mountains of this research that you're really interested in. Um, so when you but, say execution, are you talking about executing trades in the market or just execution? Exactly. Okay. No. Ex- executing your trades in the market. Right. So having good, reliable software that links to your broker or to the exchange or however you're, however you're executing your trades, um, but also having a, a good counterparty as well. So if you're going through a broker, it's got to be someone um, you know, who's giving you a good deal. And mm-hmm. um, Because, you know, having, uh, you know, being on the bad side of, of that sort of thing can can kill a, a really good trading strategy. Yep. Um, and, it's, and it can be a matter of, you know, of, of basis points that can make all the difference so um yeah my advice is really don't overlook that it's it's really important yep okay cool and what's your favorite uh, so, oh sorry sorry andrew sorry to interrupt um can i say something else cool. on that yeah. um so one other thing that's really important um particularly if you come from a background like mine which by that i mean you know leaving a successful career in another field um to essentially start all over again um a supportive family environment is is critical and um, I know that I'd never be where I am today without that. So I think that's really important. Mm. Yep. Okay. Uh, 
Where were we up to? Okay, so uh, next question. What's your favorite trading book or books? Um, there's a few, um, and my, my favorite um, is not actually a trading book. Oh. Uh, but it helped. But this one helped my development as a trader more than anything else I've, I've read, um, and that's Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, which yeah. is essentially a book about psychology and about how the human brain is is incredibly poor at making statistical judgments and inferences. Um, that that was probably the thing that helped my development as a trader more than anything else. Mm. Um, but I also really like the classics like um, Bob Pardo's book. We mentioned Bob Pardo before. Yep. Um, um, evaluation and optimization of trading systems is, is his book. That's that's contains many many nuggets of gold. Yep. Um, Aronson's evidence based technical analysis is is great too. I mean, even though I don't really subscribe to technical analysis, um, he's got some some really useful insights in there as well. Yeah. Awesome. All right. And now, what is the best way for listeners to get in touch with you? Uh, via my website, robotwealth.com. Easy one. All right, cool. I'll, I'll add a link to that on the show notes page. Um, all right, well, thank you very much for your time today, Chris. I really appreciate you uh, chatting with us. Is there anything else that you want to mention before we finish up for today? Um, only that machine learning is an incredibly exciting and rewarding field to get into. Um, and if, you know, if you're thinking about it, the time's never been better than to, to dive in and, and have a go. Yep, absolutely. It's not too late, is it? Certainly not. Certainly not. It's This is in its infancy. Um, I think it's only going to be bigger and bigger in, in the future. Yeah, cool. All right, Chris. Well, thanks again for your time today and uh, sharing your insights into machine learning and, and uh, strategy validation and, and loads of other stuff. So it was great for you to share uh, with us today and I wish you all the best. Thanks, Andrew. You too. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Okay, so a big thanks to Chris for sharing with us today. It was really great to have him on the show. If you'd like some more information, then head on over to the show notes page at bettersystemtrader.com slash 82. You can get a copy of the transcript and uh, we've got some links to other relevant content there as well. So go and check that out, bettersystemtrader.com slash 82. Anyway, that's it for another session of the Better System Trader podcast. We'll have something more for you next week. So catch you then. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Better System Trader podcast. The next step is to head over to bettersystemtrader.com for more expert tips, practical advice, and exclusive content. Catch us next time for even more great ways to improve your trading here on Better System Trader. Better System Trader.